afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, The All Generation Library. I'm Jamie Machik with the Nicolay Federated Library System in Green Bay. We're glad to have you here. We're going to get started right away. Some of you, as I mentioned in the pre-show announcements, might have seen Rachel, Monica Wilcox, our presenter at the WLA conference in Milwaukee, and or maybe you didn't, and that's why you're listening in right now. Either way, we're glad to have you here. Um, Rachel is a systems change expert, attorney, professor, and conflict resolution skills trainer. She teaches Wisconsin, Wisconsin's only advanced elder mediation training, serves on the Wisconsin Bar's Dispute Resolution Section Board, and has chaired many programs for the State Bar of Wisconsin. She's also a frequent public speaker on her practice areas of creative curriculum, design, victims' rights, elder law, conflict resolutions, and human trafficking. So Rachel, whenever you're ready, please begin. Thanks so much, Jamie. I'm really glad to be uh, with all of you today. This is one of my favorite presentations to give because, um, because it gives me a chance to share some big picture thinking about aging and then how it relates to something that I dearly love, which is libraries and the love of learning, which is what I think libraries really stand for. Um, before I became a lawyer, I was a poet, and I had a Fulbright in Greece for poetry. And so um, in this era where we're making a lot of cuts to the arts and to the humanities, I feel passionate about the work that you do to continue to uh, open up access for people to this amazing gift of collective learning across cultures and across history. It's pretty profound. So you know I love you. Just wanted you to know. So a couple things off the top of my head. I'm going to shut off my webcam at the moment now that I've said hello to everybody so that we can kind of focus on the slide. All right. So we have a lot of things that can be covered in this presentation. I'm going to move through it fairly quickly because um, I'm hoping to leave about five or ten minutes at the end for people to, to chime in and, and send Jamie things to share and ask questions about. So we'll give a broad overview of some of the demographics about aging. We all think we know this because we've been hearing it for several years now about how our demographics are changing, but it's going to be nice, I think, to drill in on some Wisconsin details. We'll talk a little bit about myths because if you have a public institution, cultural myths are operating in the background all the time, and pinpointing those will help us to be more creative about and mindful about choosing how we choose uh, library programming, use of resources, engaging people. We'll talk about accessible spaces that best practices show how do we do this to create an intergenerational functional system. Maybe touch a little bit by keeping and using older volunteers. And then if we have time, I'll share some of my, um, my key points about effectively dealing with conflict. Uh, not avoiding conflict, you'll notice, because I believe that we got to embrace conflict for its transformative power. So I'll share some tips about that. And then just recommendations and ideas, and that's the part where I hope as the presentation proceeds, all of you are going to be saying, hey, I have this idea that relates to the slide. Let's talk. Let me share that. I want the group to know that I have information about it so that maybe there's a dialogue that can be started from this talk. All right, there we go. So trends. We've got three main trends that I identified in this presentation that I think are affecting everything we all do, and in particular, libraries. So demographics, longevity and health, work, retirement, learning, and how those three components have changed from what we used to think they would have looked like. So I'm going to go through each one of these separately. And um, hang on, I'm just going to minimize my control panel. OK. I like this slide. This is from um, Wisconsin Department of Health and Human Services and of Long-Term Care. Sorry about that. Use my screen for a second. OK. What you notice here is that these slides with color represent how we are changing. Um, the amount of red, the, the red color indicates a high percentage of the population per county being over age 65. So right now, we're well past 2010 and kind of approaching 2020. We no longer have any counties where less than 12% of the population is over 65. And that right there says something. 
If you fast forward here several years and get us into 2035, the estimates show that, oh, I would, I would say that's like seven-eighths of the state will have almost one-third or more of the population per county being over age 65. One particularly shocking statistic from this era and the predictions is that if you're up here, I don't know if we have anybody from Bayfield County, but in Bayfield County, in the year 2025, approximately 95% of the population is going to be over age 65. So that will affect everything. It will affect costs for health care that counties bear. It will affect costs for other kinds of public services that folks who are aging need more of. Public benefits definitely being one of those because people who haven't made plans for retirement and the economic realities of it will become more dependent on public benefits. And the library is a public benefit. So on this slide, I will point out just for a second that I recognize every person in the audience today might be from a different place. Some of you might be from the urban centers of, of the state where we have Dane County with a very high population, Milwaukee, very urban. Um, but many of you may come from much smaller counties. And because of these demographics, things might affect your system differently and the kinds of choices you make about your programming and about the people who you serve, and even about your staff and who is available to work. That can be a very, very important issue for libraries. All right, longevity. This one we know pretty, we've, know, we've known this for some time, but it's nice just to look at it visually. So in the last 100 years, approximately, we have had a 27-year uh, gain in life expectancy for men and a 30-year gain in life expectancy for women. I won't spend too much time on this slide, but just to note that the past year, the census data actually for the first time in 30 years or more saw a slight decrease in the female lifespan uh, from what it, it had been. We went from about 80 years as the lifespan, life expectancy for women, down to approximately maybe 78 years. And one of the pieces of data that, that, Ruth, that was the, the impetus for that change had to do with the amount of deaths from opioid and heroin and narcotic overdose, sadly. And so it's affected certain things that our society are affecting longevity in ways that you wouldn't think. Um, but the other statistic of note that's interesting is that if a woman reaches age 70 approximately and has not yet developed one of the major three illnesses of um, cardiac symptoms, heart, heart failure, um, cancer, or I think what the other one is would be like COPD, if she has not experienced symptoms or complications of those issues up to that point of 70 years, her likelihood of doing so and developing in the last part of her life is very, very slim. So preventive care is really important for everybody now that we've got this longer clock on life. So when it comes to work and retirement, we have a lot of differences as well. And it can be shocking to think about the economic implications of how many people are providing care for aging family members. And this statistic from AARP points out the family caregivers of about 600,000 just in Wisconsin with an estimate of $6 billion worth of services. Now, this component is not just folks caring for aging parents. It may also be folks caring for adult children with special needs or um, grandparents caring for grandchildren. So here's that statistic, uh, which would be important for those of you in libraries, because if you're a grandparent, you do what most parents do, which is try to provide learning resources for the ones in a healthy environment. And because of these numbers, so we have 5% of Wisconsin kids living in homes with a grandparent where the grandparent is responsible. And the even more interesting stat that 17% of the grandparent caregivers are living in poverty, which tells me that in your county, if, if you're not seeing a lot of these folks, I'm surprised because the library is often seen as a place that provides many types of community resources that are low cost or free for people like grandparents trying to raise grandkids. 
So in my working life, one of my roles is as an elder law and an estate planning attorney, and I provide mediation services and conflict resolution for families dealing with issues of aging. And this slide is just to explain to you that all families are different, but most families face the same series of issues in one degree of severity or another. Finances, and mainly that's finances to pay for health care costs, long-term health care, um, moving out of the home or staying in it, safety and freedom, because these two things are in direct conflict with each other many times. So the desire for mom or dad to stay in their home and age in place versus um, the, the kids' fears about one or other of the parents um, just having very dire health consequences from repeated slip and falls. Mom and dad are living in a four-story home with staircases, and there's just you know not a good sign that things are going to improve. So, but mom and dad want their freedom, and they feel like as they age, they lose their voice in order to be respected for their choice to be unsafe, which we all still have as we age. So then, of course, there's the desire just to be integrated with one's family and surrounded by people that love and care about you. Um, and then there should be one more member on this slide, on this little graphic here, and that would be an animal of some sort. Uh, because in families, the, never underestimate the importance of a companion animal to somebody who has um, Alzheimer's disease or some other kind of disease that limits their ability to communicate verbally and to express love and affection, or to even process short-term memory. All right, those are the typical issues. I want to go through some myths about aging. And these are because when you're working in a public institution and you see people of all kinds coming in, there tends to be a lot of stereotyping and unconscious biases that operate. And calling out these myths can help you identify things that you might be doing in your library or ways that you do certain types of programming that you might want to think about retooling um, in response to some of the feedback. All right, so first things first, um, and I'll just quickly check in here on my control panel. All right, just to make sure I'm not missing anything from Jamie. All right, so the first myth you're going to feel old. The research shows that if you ask older people, how old do you feel versus how old are you? Most of them who are fairly positive in their outlook about life and well supported will, will say they feel on average about 10 to 15 years younger than their actual age. And why that is, don't know. People's internal impressions of how old they feel are very often about 10 to 15 years different. And most of the time that's in the the younger direction rather than feeling 10 to 15 years older than you actually are. Uh, second myth is that your brain power is going to decrease. Not so. Uh, the American Psychological Association's research showed that verbal and math abilities and spatial and abstract reasoning all improve in middle age. And the other issue that's very important is that as brains age, they sometimes com they compensate for a slight amount of cognitive decline in the processing of information by getting better at using both hemispheres of the brain. Whereas younger brains, in contrast, only use one hemisphere until they have to actually use both hemispheres because it's a particularly challenging problem. So that is um, a myth that your brain power will decrease. All right, you'll have less fun in bed. Well, that's a myth, too, and this uh, stat comes from a study by Judith Horstman, the Scientific American Healthy Aging Brain National Survey of Men and Women Between 75 and 85 said um, that statistically over those over 60 years old absolutely want and enjoy sex. The caveat to this research was that over three quarters of the respondents to this particular question were men. Um, I know there's other research out there that supports that women also in, in older, later life enjoy companionship and intimacy just as much as older men do. Um, you're going to be stuck with your bad self. 
understand that myth is disproven, but there are many positive lifestyle changes. Quitting smoking, for example, has uh, directly an impact on health. So that is also something to think about. One study that's one of my favorites, this research was done by a colleague of mine at Marquette University in their uh, athletics, um, in their athletics doctoral program. She studied weight training in 75-year-old women. And on average, they had these, these, these ladies do their weight training routine 30 minutes a day, three days a week. At the end of the study, they had actually added six years to their lifespan. And uh, so there are changes that can be made. And you don't have to be stuck with something that you think you've always done your whole life and you can never change it and there won't be consequences. Um, myth six, you're going to be less happy. In fact, many, many people past midlife view it as their happiest period. Uh, the surveys find that in the 40s, happiness dips. A lot of pressures on 40-year-olds. There's that mortality clock that kind of kicks in. I think in our 40s, Many of us are starting to really see our own parents and others around us aging and have a feeling like we haven't yet achieved anything of value in life and have a long way to go. And there's financial worries and kids in college and, and many things that make the 40s not so much fun. But after age 50, people start to feel much more content with life and much more, um, uh, to phrase it another way, after 50, you just don't care what anybody thinks anymore, and you're going to be yourself. And there truly is research that proves that as um, being something that's, that's across the board and not just particular individuals. So it is statistically not true that everybody becomes frail. And um, getting older is a risk factor for frailty. But the data just doesn't support that every single person has that experience. And again, as I pointed out with the weight training study, you can do something about it. You can make lifestyle choices to prevent that from happening. Um, people sometimes think that the empty nest syndrome is the, is the bell tolling for a change in marriage, and it isn't going to be a good one. But that's not necessarily true. Um, Far from being lost and depressed when all the kids are gone, many couples find they are very happy to return to having more time to themselves, uninterrupted quality time, opportunities for travel or for pursuing hobbies together. So um, while we do have statistically more graying divorce, right, where people just do move on, that doesn't necessarily impact people's life satisfaction. I think that divorcing couples late in life often see that just as um, a recognition of changing personalities and needs and interests, as opposed to a failure of a marriage where they couldn't work things out. It's a very different way of characterizing it. So I will point that out from my own experience in elder law and doing some research on, quote, the graying divorce. OK. This stat impacts most of you more than any other one in the survey, I think. The myth that you won't learn or grow. And that's not true at all. Um, neuroplasticity is this concept that the adult brain has the ability to change its structure and function in response to experience. So the whole idea that now we have the idea of self-directed neuroplasticity, meaning if you choose to work on it, you can rewire your own brain. So certain, uh, certain techniques such as meditation or even yoga or breathing techniques, physical exercise has a big impact on neuroplasticity. Uh, you can, in fact, teach old dogs new tricks is the idea to take away here. Another myth is that people inevitably become isolated. And while I think it's possible, that that happens for some individuals. Um, what the research shows is that older people are more socially adept than younger people. Because as we get older, our social intelligence continues to expand. And uh, we're better at sizing people up. We're better at telling if they're lying or not. You're um, not 
starting all of your authentic personality when you meet somebody for the first time. So when you have an instant connection, you can really enjoy interaction socially in a way that I think the, young, the younger generations are more guarded and maybe not even quite secure in their own social identity. So socializing is so important for health. And it might actually be one of the best things that we could do for our aging brains because socialization actually decreases stress and the perception of pain, among a lot of other health benefits. So this research comes from um, uh, Martin Gap, Margaret Gap, sorry, professor of gerontology at the University of Southern California. And so, um, yeah, socialize. You'll feel less pain. Isn't that interesting? I like these. Um, these are just great that's to share with other people, and you always carry these unconscious biases. Um, so the final myth is that we lose our control. We lose all of our power to stand up to our children who say, no, you can't drive, or we lose all of our power to walk into a grocery store and not have somebody call you sweetie. I think those are the little, it's such a cliche word, I'm, I'm hating myself right now for saying it, but those are microaggressions that are used so much uh, over people as they age in our society here in America. We don't have this long destiny that certain other nations do, such as the Eastern countries where revering our elders, or even in Native American wisdom, where the elders, you, you don't interrupt an elder in Native American culture. They hold all the power because of their wisdom and it's recognized socially. We don't often carry those things into our day-to-day -day Western culture in America. And I think the microaggressions are a way of suggesting you get, you get bombarded by them, but you do have some control over that. So um, the American Journal of Psychiatry found that successful aging was really dependent on seven factors that are fully within an individual's control. So alcohol use is one, smoking status is another, marital stability, exercise, body mass index, coping mechanisms, and last but far, by far not least, education. So aging well, if you think about all of those seven factors, there are many of those that are under a person's control and have nothing to do with how much resources you would have as an individual. You can, you can make a difference on all of those things without needing to have a great deal of money, uh, or whether or not you live in a very resource-rich community. Those are still things you can change. So when we know we have power, we can make different choices about things and uh, have different, different experiences. All right, so let's talk about libraries specifically. I pinpointed these three areas as places where we can really make a difference in how we think about serving people. So ageism is one, where now that we've gone through those myths, do you see things that are happening um, in your day-to-day -day workplaces and in the library and how you deliver services that, that you think you could target, that you could change somehow? that you can deconstruct some myths in a very obvious way or maybe in a very subtle way. The second area is where sometimes lack of training about something as specific as how to interact with people who are hearing impaired or what do you do with people um, that you think are exhibiting signs of dementia. And this might be a patron that you've had for many years who comes in, and then all of a sudden you're noticing things, things are, things are not, not as they used to be. And it might be interrupting services in some way. So you have, oh, I could just take a guess from my practice, three, three to $500 worth of overdue book charges, and the books are somewhere in a home with many, many other things stacked from floor to ceiling. How is patron, you know, how do you deal with that as library staff? Do you understand what might be happening in terms of the aging process that would then give you a better handle on interacting with the patron or on interacting with the patron's family if there's an opportunity to do so? So training. And again, I think if you, if you think about training needs, 
the mistake here would be to say, well, we only need our service professionals who deal with our senior center or our uh, senior services. They're the only ones who need that. Not so. You're going to have to train everybody across the board because approximately a third of the patron population that you're going to see will be over the age of 65. So it's too big a number not to train everybody. Structural isolation. Whoops, I'm back up. Can I do that? Yeah. Structural isolation. And this little, and this is an example of this would be something like saying, our senior, our large print section, um, we, we've put all of our aging, so to speak, research, you know, resources in that one section. And so you would segregate off certain types of material in one place versus having maybe small islands populating all different parts of your library space. Structural isolation, just giving us some thought about how we choose to do things. So to see these things, instead of being obstacles and challenges, as being truly growth areas, uh, ageism leads to things like consciousness raising, consciousness raising and awareness. Lack of training means you could partner with your ADRC, your Aging and Disability Resource Center, or you could partner with the Alzheimer's Association or a healthcare setting in your community that's doing some programming. And by virtue of partnering with community organizations to address these issues, you can get more bang for your buck. You can develop collaborative partnerships that enrich both institutions. You can expand your volunteer pool and your network. And you can really um, gain things that are as, as, as concrete as financial sponsorship for programs that are offered. So I think that you have to look at ways that these become opportunities. And the goal is you're creating resources that support everybody. And for example, leverage overlapping goals of different groups. What does that mean? Hmm. That means when you have a large population of grandparents coming to the library to seek resources for themselves, you can also partner with an agency or with some resources that directly target learning, best practices learning, and innovative technology tools for kids. And how do you do that at the same time? Well, maybe you create a really innovative kind of a story hour that shows how you can use an electronic interface or a website to have grandparents uh, learn how the technology works and then share it with kids in certain ways. Just an idea. So you can reduce areas of friction by providing more learning about different things, supporting self-reliant volunteerism, and celebrating progress in well-being and community. So these goals we're going to talk about a little more in all of the next few slides. One more piece of research that I wanted to share um, because I think when you're thinking about, well, how do we, how do we innovate? What kinds of information will help us innovate in the right way and in a good direction? The AARP did a great survey. This is um, a survey of over, it was 1,020 Americans over the age of 50. And I'll share just a few pieces from the top dream. Well, interestingly enough, this is age 50 and over, right? So when we think about aging, we have, um, and this is a woman named Mary Pfeiffer who wrote a book called Another Country about aging. And she had a phrase that she said, it's the young old and the old old. So the young, we're talking about young old, and in my experience, 50 is not old by any sense of the word, really. Although you do have individuals who have present a lot of health care issues and they feel very old. But 50 is really old. It's just a, it's a much different phase of life. Hobbies and interests. Kids, grandkids, family, and friends. Isn't it funny how this one actually came first? And this came first almost twice as much. Yeah, so the whole idea that, oh, my grandkids are everything to me. Well, if you really ask people, these are the dreams. These are the things that people say, I need, I want to use my time to pursue. Um, the research also indicated how people want to learn 
And these are really interesting pieces of information. If I were in the library system working, I would want to know. People want immediate access and easy access. They're not really willing to spend a lot of money on learning because there's so much available for free, of course. Hands-on learning that improves quality of life quickly because people don't feel like they have a lot of time to waste. Newspapers, magazines, books, and journals by far came to the forefront as the preferred method. And people mostly want to stay current. They want to um, think about spiritual or personal growth. And, um, but again, that immediate impact, right? And I think, one other piece is I have a handout. You have the slide. Oh, no. let's see. The best ways to learn, according to the survey, was that 45% of people said they like to watch or listen and then think about it. But by far, 60% of the respondents said the best way that they like to learn was by putting their hands on something and playing with it or figuring it out. So if, if your library is primarily devoted to, to print, right, print content, are there ways that you could draw more people in by making the learning experience a lot more tactile? Or by combining something, like a, a new book, and in especially, right, like cooking books, which are really popular. What if you had some kind of an event that was actually a demo? And then you could, you, could, you know, and these are all just ideas of things to do. And they could be coordinated with community partners and um, obtaining sponsors to do that, I think, fairly easily for the finances. So spaces, accessible spaces are important. But I have this slide that tries to exhibit that all of these pieces, your space, right? Like, do you have your aging section bracketed off from everything else, or your kids section bracketed off from everything else? And there may be reasons to do that, but there may also be opportunities to open open the structure of your space a little bit differently. Technology, programming, and how communication happens. We didn't talk in the last couple slides about the use of social media as a preferred tool for learning, but I would love to see some recent information. I'll have to dig for it for my next iteration of this talk. I'd love to see just how many of those, those folks over 50 are using social media as a learning tool. We know for a fact many of them use it as a communication tool primarily. So does your library have a Facebook page do you have um, a group of volunteers that specifically post on that page with regard to things that older patrons might be interested in more than other people? Um, something to consider. So all these things put together lead to a culture of access, right? And that's really what we're looking for. I have a couple of websites here that I wanted to point out to people. And this is a screenshot that I'm going to drop out of my presentation for a section a second and go here. OK. Um, some of you in the audience are probably going to be experts about library accessibility. And this is you know, under the law, what is required by the Americans with Disability Act, et cetera. Excuse me, I'm just taking a drink for a second. OK. So this website, which is Association of Specialized and Cooperative Library Agencies. I love their tip sheets and their toolkit because what we see here is that accessibility is not just about aging, per se, or about um, one particular type of issue, but there's all kinds. And for example, you know, if you're to look here, what does a tip sheet look like? Hopefully we'll one up here. Great. So it's very simple, but it does give you, and what I love about it is that it gives you tips, and then it gives you resources, lots of resources, but the tips are very practical. So this is how you ethically figure out a platform of communicating or for working with volunteers. It's also how you might dig for some information if you're running into a challenge or a conflict situation with a particular person. So 
don't know if any of you have ever had this, but for example, if you have a patron with a mental disorder such as schizophrenia, as you might know, when people with schizophrenia are taking their medication that's been prescribed and it's adjusted right for them, they, they exhibit as almost no different whatsoever than an ordinary member of the population that does not have schizophrenia. But if a person does not take their medication, it's a very different experience for everyone. And if you don't see that coming or know how to deal with it, you may be at a bit of a loss. So you now have this in your toolkit, and you can think about these things mindfully. What I love is the idea that for training purposes, for example, you could take any one of these tip sheets, right, and you could have a one-shower, just a one-shower training. If you're pulling your staff together for a staff meeting, um, or even pulling some of your volunteers together, you could pick any one of these and pull up the tip sheet and then go through some of the points and have some good conversation about not only what's the best practice, right, but what do we choose to do in our culture, right? This resource is um, helpful because it will also link you into assistive technology which is one of the most convenient best practice types of things to do when you're working with um, populations that are aging or populations with other kinds of special needs, whether they are physical or emotional or cognitive. All right. Hopefully I'm not making everybody seasick, moving all over the place. Um, another web resource. Hope you love this as much as I do. And I'm going to show you the screenshot here and then back out and go dirt wood. Help. There we go. And go over to my web browser and okay. So the Creative Aging Toolkit for Public Libraries. There's so much here. And what they have is a number of different things on these tabs. Just like I did, they will tell you, not for Wisconsin, but they'll tell you nationwide all of these things, new patterns, work, impediments, and then the implications for libraries. What do you think about? So you can just read background information. Creative aging, they have various pieces of, um, you know, the scholars, the scholars who put together the theory and practice. I think what you're probably going to be interested in is things like the programming models that are done in libraries. So if we already click here, they're going to give you um, a, a lot of resources here. And then they give you a number of different kinds of case studies, right? And so let me back out here. And let's see. Resources. Case studies. These are very cool. Um, they have one that talks about partnering with the senior center. One that talks about a visual arts workshop. Remember how I talked about the tactile nature of learning, how people really, that's, that's a big deal. Well, okay, you want to do it, but how do you do it? You probably have everything you need right in your community to pull this together. And then an intergenerational, interdisciplinary, um, and a couple others here. So this is a sustainability and an art center. Uh, don't, don't get the wrong impression that you need to come from a very urban or resource-rich community to do these. I have looked into each of these, and they're all, in my opinion, very scalable. You don't need to go crazy and have a, a lot of it, but you can use the ideas. So the other important thing about this tab is that it talks about the planning stages. And I very much think this is wise. The first thing that you're going to do is some kind of a needs assessment. and you probably, within your system, have already done all kinds of needs assessments. But what I encourage you to do is to consider what needs in our needs assessment if we make our survey broad enough, will we really targeting all of the pockets of our community and our population? So did you get in touch with somebody from the health department when you did your survey? Did you get in, in touch with somebody from law enforcement? What about somebody from the hospital? What about somebody from the school? And you want to do it all together, right? Because the idea is that siloed resources are much less impactful to you as a library system. 
you're much better off planning a program that has a certain soft focus, but that will be of interest to everyone in your collaborative community. And reviewing resources, considering partnerships, right? You don't have to partner, but you can. And the reason you consider partnerships is because it helps you fund a program, right? Not and most institutions in our communities these days are not receiving sufficient grant support or other kinds of public dollars to be able to pull things off all by themselves. And I would encourage that the sooner you start forming collaborative alliances for programming in your community, the better you'll, the better off you'll be, so that we end up not competing with each other um, in this era. Um, where, where government grant dollars are going to become scarcer and scarcer. This is really important. Um, all right, so you know how to find this now. And as you can see, it's very resource rich. And to my knowledge, there's even additional toolkits, tools and samples, videos, um, lots of resources here. And it's very, it's very user friendly. Okay. Um, so considering volunteers, I think that because there are a great many people in your community after the retirement age, quote unquote, whatever it's going to be, they still are very active. They want to be engaged. They want to be of purpose and meaning. So how do you use them? Uh, I'll be honest that the challenge most places face is that they say, I don't have time to manage all these volunteers. We don't have time. You either need a paid coordinator or a volunteer coordinator who is just absolutely dedicated and committed. But if you can't get either one of those two things, you could consider a, an advisory council of senior volunteers. You could consider asking certain individuals in the community, maybe it's the retired CEO of a company that was very successful. Um, you could form an advisory council that would then help you to shape programming and ways to say thank you, how you coordinate volunteers. And this part here about building community through communication channels, there again, is there a portion of the library Facebook page or a newsletter that goes out that's um, an online version um, or a series of um, a series of after hours meetings that pulls together the volunteer community? to form a cohort in and among themselves. That's how you get them to be self-sustaining, right? And then to communicate back and have staff representation all along in these communication channels or in my advisory council. Ways to say thank you. Uh, I just give this as an example because I found it very useful to me. It was sort of like saying, every time I meet a new person or have a, a volunteer for my new nonprofit, which provides legal services for victims of gender-based violence and human trafficking, I think about this slide. I think about what could I, how could I say thank you to this person in a way that will actually translate to being thank, thank you for, for what you've done. And I very much have um, a network of volunteers in my universe where this, this, it is extra time. It is a calendar date to take somebody for coffee and just be together. And that's time consuming. But I would help you, I guess I would encourage you to recharacterize how you schedule your work time and what it is that you're doing when you meet somebody for coffee, right? These are high impact practices that are often neglected, but they will serve you very well over time. Okay. This is just another example. So say you don't necessarily have time for coffee or you, you don't necessarily think that um, the volunteer that you're working with, right? This, this example right here goes into this part, words of affection or words of appreciation. Here you go. You nominate, you have a, a simple award that could be an annual volunteer award by your library. And then you put a little write-up and that write-up gets posted uh, physically at your library, and you might have a luncheon. If you don't have time to do that, then you can just do a quick write-up, and it's very nice to see. All right, so I'm going to move on, and just we have a few minutes, so I am going to just go through the part about dealing with conflict. Um, why do we talk about this? Well, because 
you have a perfect storm in your workplace setting, and it involves these three pieces. You have shrinking budgets and resources. You have a lot of people that change over time. And sometimes you have too much change and too many new faces. But sometimes you have too much stability. And there's territory and fighting over who does which program. And that gets owned by a certain person. And um, I'd, like to, I'd like to use examples from, from interdisciplinary places. So for example, I'll talk about business culture here instead of talking about agency or government institution culture. In business culture, unless you have a healthy amount of change, not too much and not too little, and unless you have a healthy amount of redundancy, meaning if one sector, if one warehouse that makes shoelaces burns up, do you have another warehouse that makes shoelaces? If you don't, your, your evolution will suffer and it will set you back substantially. So this whole concept of a, a changeable workforce that is permeated with some inflow and some outflow. If you have entrenched positions, you probably need to work on that. And thinking again back to the idea of this, this advisory council of senior volunteers, there may be problem solving that can be done about certain specific issues that they could help give ideas about that. So we're talking about ways to leverage all the resources at your disposal to minimize conflict. So tricking budgets, workplace changes and people coming in and going or not. And then of course, one of the biggest factors is that you deal with the public, capital P, every single type of person. Sometimes they're having a good day and sometimes they are not. And they bring it all, right? They bring it all. There's, there's the only code of conduct that sort of applies to libraries is that we're all entrenched with the idea of silence in the library. But that doesn't always happen. So this is my profanity warning. I have one humorous slide in this presentation, and it does have a swear word. I apologize. I will not keep up on the screen very long. But um, uh, again, I didn't create this. It's available as evidence that there is, in fact, a great deal of conflict in the library um, in the setting where you say that everyone's supposed to be proper and nice and calm and peaceful. Yeah, you work there, and you know it's not really always that way. All right. So what do we do about it? This slide illustrates that you, personally, will default to one of these particular conflict response styles, OK? And you may have, you may be really good at using all of these in different situations. You might be the turtle that withdraws or ignores. This is a wizard where you kind of smooth things over or accommodate things. The dolphin is collaborative. The lion is competitive. The zebra compromises. And you uh, see on the left axis here the concern for your personal goal in any given conflict situation is stacked up against your concern over time for the relationship. And the higher your concern for the relationship, the more you're going to gravitate toward smoothing or accommodating, the more your concern for your goal, like I need this, and I need it bad, and I'm going to go to the wall for it, about it, OK? And compromise is somewhere in the middle. Um, I can say, if years of training in conflict resolution, the goal is to be conflict literate into being able to choose any one of these responses equally and fit it appropriately to your situation. This is not bad. This is not bad. This is safe sometimes. It's safe. And sometimes we need safety more than anything else. However, the, the difficulty is if you're here all the time, guess what you lose? You will never actually identify, I mean it really, you'll never even identify what your own goals are. People who stay here all the time, if you ask them what they want, they don't even remember. <laughs> so don't be that. Um, think about these choices. And I have resource links on here, so if you would like more information about conflict styles, you can do that. So if you start applying this to yourself, and then you can apply it to the conflict you had in the break room with your boss 
<laughs> okay. So I just say that with all candor that the most important piece of work on conflict is what you do about your own responses. Because you cannot control other people's behavior. All you can control is your own. But this helps. Once you know where you're at, you can choose and then make progress. So what I would suggest is sometimes in particular workplaces, things are broken and the relationships are not good across the board for a system or a workplace. You might need to encourage your whole team to do a conflict audit. And you identify and cultivate people that have certain leadership skills that could be point people. You think very carefully about the kinds of communication processes you use. If you have um, a system where all you ever do is send each other emails and you never actually physically share space, that's challenging. You don't have the amount of trust foundation to communicate well. So you have to work harder to compensate for that. You will identify where there are gaps and then you can choose resources. So you can do a self-study as well, which is, again, as I said, the most important work for conflict where you're doing your own individual stuff. So I have, um, I'll just back up. Cloak and Goldsmith has this great little tiny paperback. It's um, Conflict in the Workplace, 10 Tips for Resolving Conflicts at Work. It's a great book. It's a short read. Uh, I recommend it highly. The deeper you go into this, there are far more resources, and you can consult professionals to assist, and um, all things that are listed on the resource tab of this end of the slide presentation. All right, so I'm checking my time, and it's 1.53, so I'm going to just talk about some of the very quick takeaways for wrapping up, and then I'll open up my chat room and ask you, in this moment, I will now ask you officially if you have questions or if you have thoughts that relate to innovations or things that you did that worked really well, and you want to shoot those forward to Jane, you can do that. But I'll go over my versions here. So I do think that forming a senior advisory council is a very good idea. And even when you ask people to be part of this, they'll feel thanked. That's the nice part. Um, and then you have to invest a little resources in it to keep it going and keep it vibrant and healthy. Um, I think Maintaining training is really important for all staff. Performing a needs assessment or expanding your needs assessment to be inclusive of all of the people in your community and even to be forward thinking enough. So, you know, if you haven't really thought about city planners or about the folks in government that are trying to achieve some kind of systemic change for the community, invite them to the table on this and they will help. Um, it feels very messy. A lot of times people just cringe because they say, oh, I don't want to flare. I want to focus. We can't flare. We're scared of that. We don't have enough. We're not abundant. Well, it doesn't hurt to listen to ideas for a period of time. You'll know if there's a crisis, and then you do have to focus. But if you're not in a crisis moment as a community identifying a particular issue, open up your process and it will help you in the long run. Forming alliances for programming and training, and considering new partners. If you've always done the same thing in a politically correct way that doesn't offend people, consider doing something different just for a year, just for a cycle. Start something new. Use social media. There's a lot of opportunity. If you have a local school system, you may have, um, if you were to check the curriculum of local universities or technological schools, training schools, they probably have some classes that are talking about creation of websites, for example, or mastering technology, or starting um, business entrepreneurship. If you were to offer an opportunity for the students in that class to do a project with the library, they would probably jump at the chance. All that's required is a teacher with enough sense and time to serve as a point person to coordinate with the course. And that is um, something I highly recommend. It can be very rewarding and a good leveraging of resources. They have students and bodies and time and energy and focus. And you have needs. And you can really both get a lot out of it. Um, integrating programming for intergenerational impact. Going back again to that, that site that I showed you about the Creative Aging Toolkit. And, of course, sharing 
information with others is probably one of the most important things that you could do. So if you um, have availability, those of you on the webinar, to um, follow up in conversation with each other or even at another statewide conference for the library association, you can cross-postulate. And that, I think, is the resources I'm going to talk about. Just again, these will be available to you in slides that Jamie will send out. And the conflict resources, Kenneth Cloak is here. Um, the other one that is a lot more in depth is the, the Thomas Kilman diagnostic site. So if you just remember Thomas, T H O M A S, Kilman, K A L M A N, you'll see that that's a, a very developed platform, mostly used in the business side of things, but um, lots of tools there, and they're very well known. They have a lot of white papers on conflict that might be helpful to share. Um, I'm just going to quickly give a pitch for trainings. If you are interested in conflict resolution, the, the fail-safe gold standard is a basic 40-hour mediation training, and there is one coming up pretty shortly um, in Milwaukee, and it's also an elder mediation training on specific conflict resolution skills with regard to aging and families dealing with issues of aging. And both of those are going to be in Milwaukee. Um, and you can find out about them through the Winnebago Conflict Resolution Center. And my training partner is the executive director there in my club. All right, so I'm going to shut myself up because I can talk for hours and see if there are any questions. So Jamie, what do we do? We have anybody with questions or comments? Um, I had one comment come through come through from Wen Wendy, and she talked about how their do-it-yourself monthly craft program is for all ages, and um, I think that's a great thing to include people of an older yeah. generation and some of your library programming. Yeah, and it's a great example of that tactile, um, you know, you're bringing people together, but there's a lot of tactile learning and the sharing of learning. Yeah, so, um, absolutely. I just love using it in the, yeah, in materials. A lot of just, I can just imagine that there's a lot of great materials and physical stuff um, out of that. Yeah, if any of you want to share anything you're doing, please type that in the question box. There was a question that came in earlier. Uh, you talked a little bit about, um, you know, certain cultures and respecting elders, how that, like, in our culture, it's really not as, as prevalent as in others or, or how or as much as it used to be. Um, any Is there any research that you've done to show why that is or when that shift happened? That's a very good question. So specifically looking at where's the research that shows why? Okay, well, one of the reasons I think just simply has to do with faith-based practices where in um, Eastern religions, like Buddhism and Taoism and um, Shinto in Japan, it's, it's literally such an important part of the holidays. There's holidays in China and Japan where on that day of the year, you visit the bones of your ancestors. And um, China has a policy where people get that day off work and, and kids will leave their work job in um, you know, Shanghai and go 2,000 miles to the rural province where their dad's bones are buried, where the family's bones are buried. So when you don't, for example, in America, we're pretty pluralistic, even though we have tended in certain parts of the country, we're um, a little bit more, say, maybe it's Catholic or maybe it's Lutheran, there's nothing specifically in those religions that talks about reverence for elders. You can pull certain literal phrases from the Bible, you know, thou shalt honor thy father and thy mother. However, it isn't enhanced by particular specific holidays or practices, whereas in other religions and in other cultures that tie to the direct religion, we just cements it. So we never really had that to begin with in America. I would say um, that I'll look for the research because it now intrigues me. It's like, how do we figure out why did that change in life? But if you're just asking me for my assessment of why, uh, I also think that in America, we have always put a high value, oh, and now I can think of the resource, I do have one, it's a good one. Um, it's a resource that actually relates to conflict and how different cultures have different conflict engagement practices. And as a standard, America is very individualistic. Mm. And that translates to the fact that we value productivity 
over reflective wisdom. And it certainly is built into our capitalistic democracy. And uh, the assessment is that people, once they lose, lose the workforce, do not have, they're not perceived as being valuable in society. So our demographics about work have changed a lot. And you're typically, um, I also think that certain legal provisions have made a difference for us too. For example, the creation of Social Security and of Medicare and of Medicaid, Medicare even more than Medicaid. So it's Medicare, once age 65 hits, you're entitled to your due because you've worked your whole life for it, but it leads to this perception that you're no longer a contributing member of the society. Hmm. So I do think we have to look to those kinds of trends to figure out why, why we've never had the same value placed on elders as other cultures have. It's a great question. Thank you. Awesome. Well, we are now out of time. So as, as we've both mentioned, um, the slides and the recording will be posted later today. That will be in your follow-up email. We would also appreciate you filling out the short survey. So, Rachel, I want to thank you again for a great presentation with a lot of great ideas that we can use. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining in today and for listening and for your comments. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and rest of your week, and I will hopefully talk to most of you soon. So long. <laughs>